All right, ladies and gentlemen, security incident response, very interesting, especially when it happens on a global level. And Gadi Evron is going to talk about that. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, thank you very much for skipping the long and boring introduction. So first, before anybody has any, uh, develops any expectations, this talk is not going to be technical. I always say that on non-technical talks. So please, if you like, leave. Second, some of you may have been to my Estonia information warfare talk. You guys to stand up and say, what are you talking about? Why are you doing this, etc. So to go through what we're going to talk about, it's going to include everything from, hey, there is a worm spreading. Is somebody doing something about this and why? All the way to, there is a network. It's called the Trevor Intercage. It's an ISP. It's making money. It's a private enterprise. And some people on the internet decide to shut it off? Who are you people to tell a network, a business, to just go offline because they're not dealing with their abuse complaints? So this talk relies on you, which is not something very good to say. Now let's get started. So name of the talk, Just Estonia and Georgia. Why Just Estonia and Georgia? Because everybody likes to talk about it the past two years. Somebody defaces a web page in Lithuania, actually 300, everybody in the press jumps up and says, information warfare, or not, internal issues in South Lithuania. Georgia happens. Whatever actually happened in Georgia, immediately people jump up and say, information warfare, it's the latest buzzword. But Estonia and Georgia, got to our attention because they got to the political level. President Bush, the United Nations, NATO, everybody started talking about it. But these incidents happen every day on the internet, and this is where I'm going to start. So global scale incident response and responders. So <coughs> stating the obvious, unfortunately, the internet is international. It is global. Sounds pretty straightforward. It's a network. It's across borders. We are now in Europe. I'm from Israel. <coughs> but it is global, and that is the second most important thing I learned, most important lesson I learned from the Estonian incident, the Estonian war, if you like. Because even if you had such a thing as 100% security, and whenever I hear 100% security, I just laugh out loud, you would still be vulnerable. Because of, some, of course, the, the obvious thing, somebody has a computer in Korea, and that computer is attacking you. That computer holds information you own. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to do about it? Who are you going to talk to if you even understand the language you manage to get to anybody? NATO is global, and to answer these incidents, we have to understand that. What it actually comes down to, in, in fact, is finding the right people to drink beer with all over the world. Whatever people may tell you about trust relationships and vetting environments and super secret mail lists, we actually have an acronym for that, yet another super secret mail list, or just look at the letters. Um, how are you going to handle that? And that's the first obvious part. But who does this? Who are these people who keep this global thing alive? So first off, we have the operators. They run the networks. They're all the businesses, the other types of mini or macro, macro or micro environments and societies and social structures on the internet. But who are these people who go and say, this particular IP address shouldn't be there? This particular computer shouldn't be there? That particular client of yours should be disconnected. You should be losing money right now in order for us to be safer. Just consider an abuse department. Your ISP, if they're one of the good guys, is paying one to three people, in case they're small to medium-sized ISP. They're paying them actual money all year long just to lose money, to disconnect clients. Let's do that for a second. But who are the people who go around and say, you ISP over there, you have the botnet command and control server. You ISP over there, you're holding the drop zone for all the credit card information that these botnets have stolen. 
you registrar over there. Who are all these people who talk to these guys, these companies, these individuals, these corporations, these non-profits, and get them to work together? And who on this earth gave them the right to be God? Who on this earth gave them the right to do this? And I really don't like the analogy. Analogy? Analogy, analogy, analogy. I really don't like the analogy. But when on Nanog, one of the most useless and yet useful mailing lists around, which is for network operators, people a few years ago would say, don't be the internet's firewall. Your job is to deliver traffic. Net neutrality business, right? So if today you decide to filter something on the internet, what's, it's a slippery slope, a logical fallacy of sorts. It's a slippery slope because what are you going to filter next? Copyrighted material? When it comes down to it, the people who actually respond to incidents online, I have an extra dot over there, oops. The people who actually respond online don't care. Some of us do, it's been a while now, we've had chance to get a little bit more organized, to think a little bit in theory rather than action. We just want to keep the internet alive. We care about that. We have a lot of motives, we have a lot of agendas. Some people care because it's their job. And once their job is over, they move to the next position. They don't care about analyzing malware anymore. They don't care about stopping IP addresses from connecting to other networks. Other people see that their life goal, their ambition. A lot of different agendas. And all these people, like you and me, unrelated to their actual job, unrelated to what they get paid for, go online, flame on mailing lists, and discuss how they should save the internet tomorrow. And the only way they do this, which is a discussion we'll not go into today, is by whack-a-mole, killing fires. If we see a command and control server over there, or a spam source over there, let's kill it. By kill, I mean legal takedown. You inform the responsible authority of the incident with a touch proof they can verify on their own. So you kill it, and then it pops up somewhere else. What have you done? Wasted a little bit of time, perhaps made it a little bit difficult for the bad guys, criminals, as I like to call them, not miscreants or bad guys. But then they learn, they evolve, they develop new technologies, new methods, new operations, so that when you, by the time you kill a command and control server, they're already elsewhere, if they weren't completely redundant before. Are we just wasting our time? And again, who gave the power to just a group of people, unrelated, unaffiliated, to, on a very limited scale, that is true, control the internet? And this note for just the people in the audience that are related to this, a joke. Paul Vixie runs the internet, just so we're clear. I hear about 10 people laughing, so it's good. Now, how far can we go? I really hate the, world, the word vigilante. Vigilante should mean neighborhood watch. People who go and do what they should do. It has a very bad connotation. Neighborhood watch means we have a crack house in the neighborhood. We can point it out and say, we don't want that here. Vigilante as we understand it today in society means you get a club or a gun and you go and take care of business yourself. The question is, and this is very, very shaky ground I'm going to touch on here. Say we were vigilantes. Say we did decide to take care of business on our own. There are no other authorities out there. There is nobody else out there to take care of the internet as a whole. Nobody gets paid to take care of the internet as a whole. Actually, somebody probably does, but they can't. Somebody in the United States government probably gets a fat paycheck to tell them we can't fix the internet. Or let's create offensive weaponry to create deterrence on the internet so that we can defend ourselves by destroying it or something like that, I don't know. So I don't like that term. And stakeholders, intentional Buffy uh, typo, vampire slayer. Other stakeholders, there are companies with actual inherent interest in keeping the internet alive. Consider all the companies out there, all the organizations out there. I'm not talking about countries, I'm not talking about you with your daily lives if you're disconnected from the internet because somebody did off the network here, which is important by itself. Consider eBay, not to pick on eBay. Consider the banking system, consider Cisco, consider Microsoft. A lot of people have a very serious vested interest in this from their own perspective. 
So, who we face? It's a lot of noise, just background noise. I keep comparing it to background noise because while it's huge, while millions of people are losing their credentials, their banking credentials, their credit cards every day, which we don't really hear about, it's background noise because I can still download porn, I can still argue on my favorite forums who, who the best starship captain was, Kirk, right? The card. Let's hear it for Kirk. Who here likes Kirk? Come on. Yeah. As long as you don't say Janeway. <laughs> Come on. So it's background noise, but the problem is the background noise keeps increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing. And if I need to leave my security perspective aside, just take a step back from being a security guy. I don't care. As long as this background noise is maintained, but the internet is still alive, users can still download porn, can still access their bank, it's fine by me. Of course it's not, but let's say that it was. Fighting back, holding back the tide, all these things don't really hold water anymore. And looking at the financial crisis, which I really don't want to use the, as a very strong analogy, people have been talking about the financial crisis, about the credit in the States, about all these subprime issue. And they've been talking about it for how long? And now suddenly there is a financial crisis, nobody knows where it came from. This crisis, while I'm very careful not to, com to compare it to the financial crisis, it's out there. The internet is not a safe place, another obvious statement, another tourism, if you like. How do we stay alive on it? And more importantly, who makes sure we stay alive? And if you get, uh, you need a mic. You'll be talking about, uh, I'm repeating. Okay. You were talking about that every individual should stay You should just wait for the microphone. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Uh, you were talking about that every individual should uh, use the possibility to uh, surveillance the internet by itself for a small part and take I the law. I didn't say that and take the law. And you said that. <laughs> okay, might be. Uh, anyway, uh, wouldn't it be the, uh, the, the right and the, um, the need of, for example, a, a government or organization or even Which something? Which government? Uh, individual gov governments. The internet, I really like this term. Somebody gave it to me. I can steal it completely. Yeah. Some, I'm, t I'm talking here. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is the only functioning anarchy or mm. functional anarchy, if you like. But please, go on. But, you, but do have, yes, sorry. you do have organizations, for example, not for the Internet, but for the United Nations, which... Uh, United Nations, let's go with Interpol for a second. Yeah, One okay. of the biggest problems we have mm -hmm. today, forget for a second law enforcement trying to communicate inside their own country. If they want... I can't give you actual examples, although I have them, so I should shut up about it. If law enforcement in one country wants to communicate with law enforcement in another country, it takes up to... It <laughs> Only in child pornography it works well, and then not always. It takes six months at the minimum to try and get the point across. And when we talk about the internet, I get phone calls. Other people get phone calls when they say, hey, can you help me out with an IP address? I say, sure, what IP address do you need? Yes, it's from 2005. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna, your question is very interesting, but it's not relevant to the talk, so I'm going to be an asshole and tell you not to ask it. So, yeah, but I, okay, go ahead. You're, you're so nice, you're smiling. <laughs> if I may. No, uh, anyway, uh, I think that uh, every nation, now for itself, does have a problem with the internet. Uh, you mentioned the Estonian case, you mentioned uh, Georgia, the United States with tight Please, rain. You know what, seriously, though, no? wait with the question. Okay. Keep the microphone, wait with it, okay? Let's move. So, what it comes down to is usability, functionality, function, functionality keeping the internet up. Now, not crying wolf, I'm known for being interpreted as crying wolf. The sun will still rise tomorrow. The world isn't going to die, and yet. What if, right? I like this what if. The internet wasn't here, or a portion thereof. Wasn't here, it went down. What would we do? We saw in Estonia a future case where they vote online. They're now gonna vote with mobile phones, right? What's gonna happen? So we know what's gonna happen. Die Hard 4.0, anybody saw the movie? <laughs> Great movie, doesn't really mean much, but it has a broad perspective really well. Maybe it's just Estonia, but 
the talk is who clean, I, I can't say shit on the talk, I can say crap apparently, oops. <laughs> so this talk is about who cleans this crap up after it happens. How can they help you and how you can help yourselves? And now we're really getting started. But thank you for interrupting me all the time, this is really useful. I'm not being sarcastic for once. So introduction story number one, really quick. So very, very careful language, some Russian speaking internet surfers get upset. Estonia goes kaboom. They didn't really go kaboom because they were really, really good at responding. Instant response saved their asses. Can I say asses? Too late. But they're a special case. They're a really small country. And they had a cert that worked really well even though it wasn't supposed to. So everybody got together. Incident response. You're not judged by having incidents. You're judged by how you respond to them. And then, of course, international infrastructure. If they didn't have the help of the community, and why did the community help? Why did other certs help? They helped because DDoS affects the internet, not just Estonia. It's not picking sides. So getting started here, you can Google, I'm going to pimp one of my articles, online mobs, and you'll find the whole story about Estonia. But why did everybody get involved? What happened there? They were under attack as a country. DDoS affects the internet. They needed other people to solve this problem. Simple facts. Georgia. Russia, very careful language here, gets annoyed with Georgia, or Georgia or Gruzia. I'm not really sure to call them anymore, I'm sorry. They enter with bombs and tanks, which really calls for, we don't need cyber anymore, right? Now, the tech journalists get overexcited. I don't remember who originally had this quote, I'm stealing it. But basically, tech journalists wet dream. I can report about war sitting behind the computer screen. War reporting without any risk. So everybody immediately shouts cyber war. Again, the favorite buzzword. Was it, wasn't it, doesn't matter right now. The interesting thing is, one interesting thing about the attack was the time window of the first attack. Started two hours before the tanks went in and the two hours after. Controlling the media, communication, etc. Very useful, very interesting. Maybe could be attributed to Russia because if it wasn't them, I would still have done it. Black worm. I have been criticized about that quite a bit. So it was a relatively small scale spreading worm, but it was a destructive one. It would destroy your documents in a well, nutshell. CADA followed it with some uh, statistics and they saw several hundred thousand infected. We all got together from US CERT through SANS all over the world. People looked at IP addresses. ISPs went, wasted time and money to call users. Tell them, fix your computers. Oh, yes, there is no fix out yet, but be careful. Back up your documents. Everybody got involved. It was serious. Up until today, on the third of every month, I believe, uh, my memory isn't that good, people lose their documents and go on forums and ask, how do I recover them? It's a business now in India because that's the place that was most hit. The thing about Black Worm that was so amazing was the amazing, I say the amazing twice, the incredible incident response that happened. Forget all the coordination. We got on a phone call. The FBI opened a case file. All the security industry that was involved coordinated on what not to say so they don't, we don't hurt the FBI's case. We actually connected two field offices together so they can work. And it opened um, something in HQ. Antivirus companies added signatures and analyzed it. ISPs reported. We got several reporting organizations to send out the alerts. I can go on and on. And there was a phone call for an hour and a half with a friend of mine, Zot, at Microsoft. MSRC likes to call the Emmy Awards. Because completely unintentional, whenever you would talk there, somebody's like, thank you, Gadi, for that very kind note. Thank you, everybody, for your help. Now, <laughs> it was really annoying, this phone call. But it was very useful because everybody got there. UK, South Korea, everywhere was on that call, cooperating. We have had cooperation before. This happens all the time. Massive warm breakouts, botnets. But this was, as far as I'm concerned, a breakthrough. So here is the th third introduction story. A Facebook warm. This is very recent, a few months old. So I was the first to report it. Of course I wasn't. There are others who saw it before me and probably sent it to their antivirus companies. But as far as the community was concerned, the internet security operations community, the people who help out, I was the first to see it, completely by accident. Lots of worms out there. So it's dubious credit. I sent it in. Now Facebook immediately starts filtering the URLs. 
So you can't send new messages with them. HD Moore, completely by mistake, it was my, I, my IM at the time, I was looking for a reverse engineer, he was there. He helped me out for 10 minutes, he found the drop zone where the worm uh, drops, uh, I believe it was credit card information. So we could go ahead and antiviruses, for that matter, sorry, at the detection for the samples in record time. And then ISP started taking down the drop zone IP addresses. Again, take down whatever caveats are there. Amazingly enough, we actually managed to get together with registrars in the past few years and get them into operational, in an operational peer pressure group of sorts, where everybody helps each other, with security community in there. We have a domain name we need to take down. It's really important. There is a huge worm spreading. But they took down drop zone domain names. Facebook's security team, they had a really cool time of the month then. They had a coding night where they stay and code. So they coded some stuff. I don't know what they did up to this day, but the next day all the messages with the infecting URLs were gone. And more important than that, as far as I'm concerned, Facebook sends out email messages with the messages that were sent on Facebook. So people would still get them and click whether Facebook deleted them or not. So Serbal and other URL-based DNSBLs or blacklists added this, um, these domain names, that these infecting sites, so that new emails being sent, or at least not yet received, would be filtered. Massive coordination. The funny part, it was, we had live statistics. It was a, a web hosting company in Poland, which we never managed to mitigate. We had no contact over there to actually go and knock on their door and say, please shut this down. So we actually did refresh all the time. Oh, it went up 200,000 more. How, how cool. Eventually, they ran out of the allotted bandwidth for the month, <laughs> the entire hosting company. So we lost count at around a million visiting users. We can't know if they're all infected, right? And of course, there is us keeping refreshing this time. So that was an interesting incident. The reason I'm mentioning a smaller incident, uh, one million infected, if it went out in the press, right now, one million infected in Facebook, well, it would sound big, but it's nothing. So many bots out there, no reason even counting them. So let's start getting down to business. How does regular incident response work? Uh, limited network response for someone attacking you or whatever. So X gets hit. You, yes, you, you investigate. OK, you're good with that? Fine. Now, you try, unless you already have contacts, unless you already went through this, unless you know somebody or know somebody, you start making calls. Hey, hello, ISP. Yes, I know you're tech support, but please, please, please escalate me. So it takes you three hours to try and escalate to the knock, trying to get contact somewhere across the world. God forbid they're speaking Korean, Chinese, I don't know what. And nothing against this country, just I don't know how to speak Chinese. It's a problem. Russia and I have my girlfriend. <laughs> it's true. So anybody has a contact at Y, that's the most annoying thing. You email Nanog or some other useless, useful mailing list and say, anybody has a contact at Y? And everybody immediately shouts, that's off topic. How dare you? Say, I'm under attack, I don't know what to do. If they had an abuse team, the abuse team often doubles as the sort of unofficial cert. Why? Because they have contacts, they know people other, in other places. So this is what usually happens. You run around trying to somehow mitigate this if you can't do it on your own local level or with your uplink transit provider. If you're well connected, now if you're ex and you know why is daddy, right? The transit provider, the network manager, the CTO, the CEO, the abuse manager, his wife. I can't say shit, right? I crap you not. It works. That, that would work. You're well connected. You get people to help you. Now, if X knows somebody who knows Y daddy, Y's daddy, that works also. You can be in a peer group with Y or Y's daddy. Or you can have an active team or a person that does what a cert is supposed to do. Having a cert means nothing. Most certs just translate vulnerability reports to their own language, which is very, very useful, of course. So how does it work? There are really three main ways this gets done. Central out, as we explained, responding locally and calling others. Put people on the phone. Mailing list mishmash. You have all these super secret, yet another super secret mailing list. So somebody sends something in. Somebody else happens to be alive at that point and reply. 
somebody else has time and looks at the binary, somebody at an ISP actually looks at the network and says, ah, I found the command and control server. Whoever happens to be there. And it works. It gets mitigated. Some do it better than others. And then there is the leader slash loser. I kid you not. I'm not calling anybody else a loser except me, just so we're clear. don't want anybody to get offended. You're somebody busy, but you have some spare time. I don't know, you got back home at 2 a.m. and you decided to check your email for some reason because you're addicted. You said, aha, there is something going on here, whether on a mailing list, in your inbox, somebody called you. And you coordinate, you call Facebook and tell them, hey, did you check XYZ mailing list? Are you there? Do you happen to be on that particular yet another mailing list? Oh, guys at the antivirus world, uh, how about you add detection? You coordinate it, you get everybody to work together. So that one person, it could be Paul Vixie, it could be Rob Thomas, it could be me, not many others, because not a lot of people are stupid enough to go out and waste their time like this. Coordinate it. They just add a level of coordination, not much more. And it's, it runs smoother. Instead of one million infected, we could have had 20. Now, big internet incidents, except for Estonia where it was just big. They're either really, really big and then you notice them. You could have somebody who researches this stuff, such as Jose Nazario at Arbor, and say, I'm seeing something in my logs, can you look at that? Well, listen to him, he's a good guy. Or you have very small incidents with people who are not well connected. People like you and me. And these incidents would grow and grow and grow. Maybe well, they're on the phone trying to get somebody if they even noticed it. And then they become huge, they become big. So there is a note here I would like to make on critical infrastructure vulnerability incidents. I don't really want to comment much about the DNS bug, that's for Dan to do. I don't know much about it. I will limit myself to say that has been a huge coordination. Dan Kaminsky and Paul Vixie have done an amazing job. They got people on the phone. They got them to meet with them. They got them to release patches the same day. Huge logistical work. Huge logistical work. More than that, just consider how many people at that point started scanning the internet for recursive DNS servers. That's Dan. How many abuse complaints were sent just about that? Sandgate. I'm raising somebody, it's never a good idea to raise one of your least popular moments. Bug truck, I think it was 2005. Sendmail had a few vulnerabilities released. They've done an incredible job of patching everything within a month. But Send, Sendmail, with all due respect, is installed on so many systems around the world that it could be under some definitions considered critical internet infrastructure because of what could happen if there was, for example, a Sendmail worm. Throwing out an idea, let's not really open the discussion for now. But back then, nobody really understood the concept of critical internet infrastructure except for very few people and then they would limit it to DNS, BGP, etc. Everybody should go to Jake, uh, Jake's talk on the last day of the con. They're going to show how they're doing something nasty to critical infrastructure. Last note, um, actual critical infrastructure that everybody would agree on, SCADA systems. It's kind of like it used to be on Backtrack, why Backtrack was started. Vendors would not respond to your reports if you actually found somebody to report to. If anything, if they had somebody to actually understand what's going on, they would threaten you with legal lawsuits. lawsuits which didn't really change much <laughs> between now and then. But the SCADA industry is much the same. They have the security teams, they have people trying to get things done, they have people trying to get organized and answer on security issues. And people may jump at me from the audience and say, you don't know what you're talking about, which is always true. But I don't see many of these SCADA vulnerabilities getting patched. I see a lot of these, this research get classified, I see a lot of this research never get published, I see a lot of people not even wanting to research SCADA. And not only because of the cost involved. It, and another very good industry to look at is the games industry. Reporting a vulnerability to a game vendor is not very easy. So, so-called critical infrastructure, side note, let's leave it at that. So, where do we get to with all these people working together on data? Because we get pissed. We get annoyed. We work so hard and they just make more millions and millions and millions. Banks in the UK lose as much as 
They lose hundreds of millions of pounds annually alone, some of the big ones, just in the UK alone. It's not just an underground economy, it's unbelievably huge. If you want my numbers, talk to me later. I'm not running away. So kicking the net of the internet, I would like for there to be some sort of reliability, some sort of liability for networks. I'm not sure they would like that. Networks actually introduced regulation or the discussion of regulation with net neutrality, which was a shocker, although somebody explained it to me. They don't want to be regulated, which is fine. The US government said, this is going to be a private thing. Go and do your thing, thingy. And I said, no, no, no. Give it back to us. We want to add some restrictions over there. So a Trivo intercage, what I like to call the American R R RBN. I still don't feel very, um, safe is not the right word, don't feel right to talk about the Trivo and intercage and what happened there and how it went off the air. But whether it was a victory or whether we just once again gave them the, the criminals, not the bad guys, not the miscreants, a boost, an evolutionary boost. Go, spread around, spread your wings, make it harder for us the next time. It was a moral victory. Finally, we thought, hey, we're getting something done. For one moment, and I'm quoting Angel here, a lot of Buffy references today. For one moment, we stopped the machine, the evil machine. Spam dropped. <laughs> it was back the next day or the next week, but people felt pretty good about that. But what's the difference between a witch hunt and keeping the internet clear? Because a few years ago, networks would have said, hey, who are you to be the internet's firewall? Today they're saying, and again, I'm not quite willing to talk about how that happened yet. That network is bad enough that we don't want it here. And other networks, hosting providers, for example, that grew up saying, we have a problem making money, let's accept some just maybe black hat users for now until we grow big enough so we don't need them. Started sending emails and saying, how do we get involved with real security people? EST domains, I was very skeptical we'll get it done again. We, nobody, not me, somebody else, Ryan Krebs, Washington Post, we would get it done again as a community. EST domains, one of the biggest, a lot of swear words out there, is no longer there. ICANN got rid of it. First good thing I can say about ICANN in many, many years. Nicolo, another bad collocation provider, gone. Software, not bad people, good people. People in our community, in closed forums, started saying, we need to get rid of software layers as well. Look at them, they're not responding to abuse reports. No, we're not unreasonable people, and we don't control the internet. So we went to talk to them. Really good people, and they're working very hard to clean their act. The question is, who is next on the, on the list? Should we be doing this? Should we not? I'm saying, let's kick some ass. It's about time. But it's not as simple as that. And just as a side note, when Atrivo went down, if you looked at the, at the Washington Post story, Brian Krebs' story, there were comments in Russian, and they said, you're taking our bread away. And it's unbelievable. Some people in the Western world just didn't understand what that means. I can very simply counter that. Go make your bread some, some other way, not taking away from mine. But it's more than an underground economy. Solutions, you can get involved. What happens if you're attacked? What happens if somebody you know is attacked? What happens if you're attacking without knowing it? Do you care? How do I get in touch with you? Is your who is information updated with abuse contacts? Simple stuff. There are a lot of castle cups went down. It was foreseeable but regrettable. But there are a lot of other um, organizations out there you can be involved with as a handler. You can just look at spam and report it. Start reading the son's diary. Get involved, get to know the people, get to know what's going on. Security operations is a whole different field, much like security researching, security research, security management, completely different terminology. A security researcher, and I'm exaggerating here, would look at something and say, there is always another bug, there is always another vulnerability, I can always get in. A security manager would say, well, we need to treat what's the biggest risk, what's our biggest threat? How do we mitigate that? How do we lower the risk? What are our big gems that we need to protect? Completely incomprehensible to one another, trying to talk in one room. Security operations is yet another place where they say, something happened, how do we stop it? How do we make sure everything stays out, gets back online? 
Forget about forensics for a second, although some people may consider it important. Now, yours, what is your solution? You here, diversity matters. When I started, I said to people, why are we not sharing more resources? Why are we not doing more together? Why double our resources? Not everybody is going to work together. Diversity is good. You'll repeat mistakes that I made, other made. You'll find some things that are no longer true. We got set in our ways. We have stupid taboos. Like the antivirus industry is about sharing virus samples when they're all out there. They have a moral standpoint. That is fine. They also had a grip on the, on the, on the antivirus industry so nobody could get samples and you would, they would call you a black hat if you did. Good marketing, good business strategy. Things change. If you think about doing something, do it. If I can help you, I will. I'll also tell you how it may fail, but you should ignore me. It's really easy to ignore me. So, reasons I'm, I'm here. The EU security operations community is not organized. There are a lot of people working out there. Whether it's just seeing something and analyzing it because it's fun, or sitting on logs all day long trying to figure out what's going on. Not organized. Not many people know each other unless they're maybe in the cert uh, industry, industry, in the cert community, or perhaps they go to RIPE if they're in the network community. Get involved. See who, who else is working on this. If you're attacked, where do you go? Who do you ask for help? So I'm not the guy, but if you need somebody to connect you with somebody else, feel free to email me. I don't always, I'm unfortunately unable to answer all my email, but I will do my best to help, just to connect you with people. And of course, get things better organized. Make new friends, drink more beer. Beer matters. This is not a joke. And this is, we don't have that much time, but the reason for this talk was just so you can talk, and, and I realize the privacy concerns, the big brother concerns, the internet is gonna die concerns, practical concerns of how do we get involved, how do we save ourselves from a DDoS attack, if it's just a DDoS attack. Ask me questions. I'll try. Actually, you had a question at the beginning, you are laughing now. Somebody give the guy a microphone. Okay, I'll give it another try. I will try not to catch you this time. <laughs> okay. I uh, promise. Uh, okay, um, what my question in the beginning was that uh, I know what you're doing now, kind of, uh, at least I have an idea. But anyway, at the present situation, every country is involved. It might be attacked and it might uh, get hit, uh, or the vital infrastructure might get hit. So isn't it the responsibility of a government or uh, an international organization of in any way to do something with our taxes and get some kind of control of it? I mean, uh, is, it, is it better to uh, uh, let uh, commercial industry doing, this, uh, doing the job or NGOs or whoever? The commercial industry isn't really doing much, but... Yes, I agree with you. Somebody should be doing something. Unfortunately, it's just people. I agree with you. I'm not sure I want governments to try and fix this. But I, we need the leadership. We need the funding. We are facing well-organized, well-funded people. So yes, I agree with you. Somebody should be doing something. Unfortunately, it's only us. Why? Maybe it will change one day. Everybody is trying to do something. Whenever somebody is new in this, they say, information sharing, let's do more information sharing. That's how we can spot them. But didn't do the NATO in some kind di uh, do something? Uh, oh yeah, Estonia? NATO did something, but it, w it involved getting Hillary a break every day when they took his notes for the past 24 hours in Estonia. But of course, officially NATO did something in Estonia, sure. Everybody wants to do something. NATO are good people. They're trying to do their own things. For example, do you respond to a cyber attack with a kinetic assault, with bombs? How do you define a cyber attack? More importantly, do you even know who is attacking you? A lot of theory there, we can go into it. Estonia was really special because of the case studies, because finally we don't just understand what may go wrong like in Die Hard 4.0, but we had some strategy, some tactics, something that we can analyze and see if it would work better or not. Thank you for the question. Yes, over there, can you pass the microphone over there? I can't really hear you. The microphone isn't working. <laughs> yeah, turn it on. Good advice. Whoever said turn it on, come here to the front, please. 
give it to him, he'll fix it for you. Technical people, you should never let them deal with anything left than a computer. <laughs> VCRs, God forbid. No. no. Just ask your question, it's good. It is on. Yeah. Is it on? Hello? Yes. Oh, yeah. We, woo! Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Thank you. It is uh, about the, the th cyber war. Of I can't hear him. Everybody, please be quiet. You, be quiet. You're in the front. Go ahead. Uh, just about uh, cyber warfare and all the people saying uh, Russia and attacking Estonia directly and so on. It's about the uh, talk that uh, that was at the uh, hack in the box uh, a few days ago uh, and uh, was made by the Marcos Ranum from Tenable Security. I have no idea how to answer you because I don't know. No, the, was that talk uh, saying that cyber, uh, cyber warfare was uh, bullshit? It, I can't say cy cyber warfare in many cases is bullshit. It depends on how you define it, depends on what actually happened. Was it bullshit in the Estonian case? Yeah. No. no. Was it Russia that attacked? I don't know. Opinion, you can say yes, you can say no, doesn't matter right now. Depends on what you want to annoy. I'm sorry, I honestly don't have a question, an answer for you because it will be political. I can say one thing though, whether it was Russia or not, they sure did know how to use the after effects for deterrence. Really smart people. Whether it was them or not, I don't know. I know it was Russian speaking people around the world who got organized. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, over there. Please pass the microphone real quick. Test, test. Okay. Works. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, now, I think cyber terrorism may very well be, um, or cyber warfare may very well be the next terrorism in the sense that the governments may be responding inappropriately in order to pass their own personal agendas in order to deal with things. And I think in regard to government internet response, we have a very good example fairly recently where the government of England set up proxy servers in order to block Wikipedia from the British people so that they could actually filter out an album cover. And there was an album cover, I think it was in the 1970s, that contained a naked picture of a child. My dog wasn't born yet. Ah. <laughs> this just happened this year, but it's very interesting to me that the, the government of the UK actually blocked pretty much the whole country over what, in my opinion, was a misguided agenda. So if, it, if the Absolutely. Everything new that gets involved gets involved in politics. I agree with you. Oh, yeah. And... You know, as soon as you start putting money into blocking and, and fighting this um, cyber warfare, that money is going to be going into surveillance, into privacy. We did concerns. talk about cyber crime here. You do know that, right? But well, yeah. I agree with you. That was a very well made comment. Thank you. Just an example, though, of incident response where an incident occurred. I got your example. Yeah. It was a good comment, but now I don't have time for you. Sorry. Cool. Other questions before we finish? Yes, over there. We're not going to wait for the microphone. I'm just going to give you mine. Um, what would you suggest if you experience a SQL injection attack on your server and then you check the, uh, who is on the IP addresses where it's coming from and you have hundreds of different countries? In most cases, build a stronger SQL server. That's, that's the best advice I can give you. You can probably try and send abuse reports, you can probably try and block based on some, this is basically something you would best be responding to locally with your, I will not joke when I say that some web application firewalls, which I really hate and I find useless, are the best thing that's ever happened to filtering web based on user agent and stuff like that. It saves a lot of people behind all day long. Just look at the traffic. Global incident response may help you, it may not. Botnets are abound everywhere. Thank you all very much.